All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for calling in. Uh, this will be the next uh, live Q&A for DLS 105. Um, today we'll start like we always do and go over the quiz from the prior module, um, give you a chance to ask questions on uh, any of those quiz questions, and then we'll go through the homework where we used RMC QRA calcs. So let's see if I can get things shared and we will get going. Bear with me, I'm running on one screen today, so we'll see how this works. All right, starting with the module four quiz. First question asks, if the physical quantity result from a product of many independent process have distributions that are approximately, and those, those are gonna be log normal. So anytime we've got the product of a bunch of different things, it's gonna be log normal. If we are summing a bunch of different things, it's gonna be approximately normal. So question number two, uncertainty with respect to natural phenomena is known as, that's gonna be aleatory uncertainty, just full definition there. Question three, gave the answer away. What is the mean of a PERT distribution with a minimum of 0.05, a mode of 0.45, and a maximum of 0.75? So that answer is gonna be 0.433. If you remember, the, the PERT distribution is gonna weight the mode or most likely value four times more than the min and the max. So you can see we're taking the min, we're adding to that four times the mode plus the max, and all of that's gonna be divided by six, so we should get 0.433. Question number four asks, which of the following statements are, are true? Uh, first statement there, the triangular distribution will give more weight to the tails of the distribution in comparison to the PERT distribution. So that statement is true. Uh, second statement, the triangular distribution will give less weight to the shoulders of the distribution in comparison to the PERT distribution. That is also true. And the third um, bullet there, the mean of the triangular distribution is equally sensitive to the minimum, the mode, and the maximum that define it. That's also true. When we calculate the mean of a triangular distribution, it's the average of those three values. So the correct answer for Question number four is gonna be all of the above. And then the final question of the quiz, we're asked what the confidence is that the average annual life loss from this um, CDF is gonna be between one times 10 to the minus three and one times 10 to the minus four. So to do that, we'll pull off where our curve intercepts those lines. So at 10 to the minus three, it looks like we're around 75% and 10 to the minus four, we're at 15%. So the solution is gonna be the difference of those two numbers. 75% minus 15%, I get 60% 60, 60 which is not listed. So the correct answer is none of the above. All right, a any questions on the module four quiz? All right, Danny, can you just go over this last question one more time? What it's that you're taking 75 and 15 and the difference between the two. Can you explain that one more time? That's right. So the confidence, again, the, the CDF is giving you basically, it's a um, cumulative um, distribution oh, function. And to get our confidence, we have basically what it's saying is that like for here at uh, one times 10 to the minus four, 15% of the values are gonna be less than that value. And here we got 75% are gonna be less than at 10 to the minus three. So our confidence is gonna be the difference between those two. So when you have a CDF, you, you, you can just pick those points off the, the plot, subtract them, and that'll give you your overall confidence that your number or your result is gonna be between those two limits. Yeah, it's between the two that I was missing, so thank you. That helped. 
Yeah, so it was the it was, I was missing the difference between the two. Those I worked through it a little too quick and missed that part. So thank you. Gotcha. Cool. Any other questions? If not, let's switch over to the module five homework. I did. All right, so for, well, I had it handy, but maybe not. There's that, let's go back to where we were. All right, so for the module five homework, you all got introduced to RMC QRA calcs. So, up until recently, this has been the primary way that um, we've done our risk calculations in the core. Um, I, I put these spreadsheets together probably, oof, probably 10 years ago, and we've gradually added things to them, tweaked them here and there, but they can be a little cumbersome. And the reason for all the copying and pasting was to try to speed up those simulation times. When you have too many things in one place and you try to run it all together, it, it bogs down and you get into a situation where you have to run it and then leave and then come back. And um, doing it this way speeds it up a lot, but adds a lot of different steps. So it, it can be a little bit quirky and cumbersome to use, but once you get a feel for, I guess, where things go, it's, it, it's it's fairly simple and straightforward. So I think most people did well. There were a couple of interesting solutions that were posted to me. Um, so hopefully after we walk through this, um, it'll be pretty clear how to set these things up and run them. Um, in the module five video, I went through how to set up PFM1. So I'm not gonna cover PFM1. So for today, I, I'll go through how to set up the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet, which I did in the video. Then I'll go through how to set up PFM2 in the PFM risk spreadsheet. And then when I, I'm gonna jump from there straight to the project risk spreadsheet, I already have the solutions preset for PFM1 and PFM3, and I'll show how to pull those in and we'll go from there. Um, and then, you know, as you're following along, you can kind of look at your homework and see what I'm pulling in and compare and contrast and um, identify any errors you might have made. All right, so getting into homework five, uh, we're told to use the competing risk model. We're told not to make any PFM dominant. We're gonna do a thousand iterations and we're interested in the FN plot, so we'll have a whole series of plots when we're finished. So the first thing we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to pull the hydrologic hazard data into the uh, stage uh, frequency distribution spreadsheet. So over here, I've got the um, spreadsheet files that were pulled from the RMC website, um, pulled them out of the zip file. So we'll start there. So let's go ahead and I always like to open at risk before I open any kind of spreadsheet tends to load things a little better. So let's give that a minute. All right, so once that's loaded, it'll show up in my tool ribbon. And now I'm set to open up the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. All right, so got the cover sheet where we can type in project name, prepare, stuff like that, and then from here, I'm going to go straight to the uh, stage frequency inputs. We're going to pull the inputs from the homework file and just paste them directly into the spreadsheet. So let's line these up side by side. Let me know if any if I get too small with the zooms that you all can't see it. But all right. So the the first input is going to be for the fifth percentile stage frequency relationship. So I can copy these and then paste as values into the spreadsheet. 
Now, one thing to remember is I need to go from lowest stage to highest stage, and they need to be in order. If, for example, you know, I had something that was out of order, like this one was lower, I will get an error. Um, in all these sheets, if there's an error in your spreadsheet, the top left square will turn red. The reason this one's red right now is I've started putting in the fifth percentile and I haven't put the rest of the data in. And one of the requirements is that the maximum stage of all these relationships, they need to be the same. We gotta have a, a curve that extends up to the same spot for us to have a valid distribution. So once I've pasted in the fifth, I'll do the same thing for the 50th. And one quick and easy way to do that is if I highlight that and then hit control, I can then highlight those two columns together and paste them in as values. We always want to paste as values where specified because there's a lot of conditional formatting that's built into these spreadsheets to help you along and you don't want to override those. So we'll copy and paste and get the 95th percentile. And then lastly, we'll grab the expected value. In this particular example, the um, stages for all of these relationships are the same. That's not always going to be the case, and that's okay. Um, you know, whatever elevations I've got for the fifth percentile, they don't have to match the same points as these others. We just got to make sure that it all extends up to the same um, peak stage. Um, that said, the relationships you get won't always go to the same peak stage, particularly the fifth percentile. A lot of times it'll be something less because they don't run enough iterations to really get out that far. So this is one of the few times where um, extrapolation is okay, is generally when we're starting to get out at these really high elevations, these probabilities are super, super low. Low enough that, you know, even if we were to have something sample there, whether it's 10 to the minus 10, 12, 15, whatever, it's not gonna have any impact on anything that would possibly show up on the FN chart because the bottom of the FN chart has an APF of 10 to the minus eight. So one thing that can help you when you're extrapolating, if, you, if you're forced to do so, is to look at this plot. Um, it'll plot everything out for you. And generally we just try to it's, it's more guess and check than anything, where you're just extending the shape of this curve out until we hit the same peak stage. All right, so that, that satisfies all the inputs for the first tab. Uh, the second tab here, it's gonna pull the data over and get um, interpolate to get the relationships for consistent stages. And it's set to pull the stages from the 50th percentile curve. Generally, that's going to have enough and hit all your major inflection points. So there's no real need to change that unless you see something that's um, funky or there's a elevation missing that you want to put in. You can override these with whatever you want, provided that we're still going from low down to the high. Okay. So we, um, let's see, if we actually told you. You're told to select an appropriate distribution for this relationship. Generally, we, we are going to start with the beta PERT distribution. That works, generally works in most, if not all, situations. Um, sometimes when you get to um, the higher stages where you have a much wider range of uncertainty between 5th and 95th percentile, sometimes we have to pick inverse Gaussian. Um, but the spreadsheet will do that. So generally the, the process is to start by picking data PERT and then we'll drag that down for every relationship. And then we will look and see in column uh, L and M if we have a valid distribution. If we have a valid distribution with the percentile data that we gave it, we will get a value here. If it is not a valid distribution, you'll get an error 
And then for those, you will want to add, you know, you can switch the distribution and see if you get a better fit. Um, sometimes the data doesn't fit a distribution very well, but you can look at, I guess, the stages that you have listed there. And for example, maybe I had something at, you know, 540 and it didn't work, but it does at 542. And when you really think about it, it's, you, know, you look at the stage frequency plot and it's pretty straight through there anyway. You can just um, uh, remove the ascending stage and then carry on. So there's a couple different ways to work around to make sure that you get a valid probability distribution. When we get to RMC total risk, there are other options and other distributions that you can try if you have to, and we'll cover those in the next module. All right, so once I have these in, you'll notice I've got a set where it, it um, transforms everything to an, a non-exceedance um, Z variate. It runs the distribution on that, and then it comes back into probability. We will want to compare what we have for our expected value with the um, expected value output from the distribution that we're running. So right now, if you compare, you'll notice that we're more than two orders of magnitude off at our highest stage, and that's just because things haven't been run yet. So we will want to compare column Q and column G after we run things. Um, Let's go ahead and do that now. So to run the distribution, we'll come up to the, or to run the simulation, we'll come up to the at-risk ribbon. Um, we'll go ahead and do 10,000 iterations for this particular one, because it's pretty quick. Um, always a good idea to check your settings. If you're working from a government computer or for whatever reason cannot uh, enable macros all the time, then you will want to, um, disable the uh, multiple CPU simulations. And then the sampling, I find it always best to go ahead and remove or disable the smart sensitivity analysis. So knowing that those are good, we'll click simulate, and then we'll let the spreadsheet do its thing. It'll ask about this correlation matrix. And because you've got, basically what's happening is because of the drop down. We've got multiple distributions that are running within the same cell, and they all reference the same uh, correlation matrix, and that's by design, so that's completely okay. So we'll click yes, and then it'll start chugging through. So there was a question in the chat asked if the transformation from AEP to non-exceedance is just a complement Yes, and that's just to get the um, the value, so the values become generally positive numbers. I, I think you could do it either way. Um, and then we back out and come back to the AEP. Um, the question, another question there was, what does the hidden worksheet do? So the hidden worksheet is pulling, um, it's setting up what stages this spread, spreadsheet looks at. It's pulling those 50th percentile stuff. And then, let's see, let's see what else is, oops, that didn't work. So it, it, it's really getting, once it gets those things set, it's, it's ranking things to make sure that we have the right stages and that no stages overlap. And then also, it's everything set up for plotting. That's the primary purpose of this hidden sheet here. We'll go back and hide that. You shouldn't have to mess with it. All right, so once we run our simulation, we should be able to compare, again, our expected values, both before and after, and we get a much better fit there. 1.8 times 10 to the minus seven versus 1.5 times 10 to the minus 7. These aren't always going to be perfect. Um, they're going to be close, generally speaking. Um, best way to check it is to come over here to the plot and see how things line up. So the lines, solid black line and then the dashed red, blue, and green lines, those are going to be your input data. 
the points, so that's the black X's, the square, the, the diamond, the triangle, those are the output data. So because we're using those alternate distributions where those distributions are hitting the fifth, the 50th, and the 95th percentile, those should always line up perfectly on those lines, which we see that they do. The one thing that you want to check is to make sure that the expected value output lines up with the expected value curve, which in this case looks like it does a really good job. So we're good to go. Okay. Any questions on how to set up this spreadsheet and how to use this one? So if not, we'll move on to um, loading up the PFM risk spreadsheet with PFM2. I'm going to go ahead and leave this one open because I'm going to need the data from here to pull into the PFM risk spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and lower that. And then I need, so we will open, and I'm gonna go ahead and make some copies here because I know that I'm gonna have three different failure modes. So I'm gonna re rename them. This is gonna be PFM one, this will be PF, actually, let me take that back. It's better to go ahead and set up your first spreadsheet and then copy, but don't set it up all the way through. I say that because all these failure modes are gonna have the same stage frequency relationship. And in this particular homework, and in a lot of cases, all these failure modes have the same consequence relationships. So it'll save you some time by getting it through up to that point saving it and then copying it, then when you pull the system response data, you'll be set and good to run it. So let's just open this straight up. All right. So in our PFM risk spreadsheet, we've got worksheets for the hydrologic hazard, we have some for life loss, economic cost, and then we also have um, sheets for the nodal probabilities that we're going to pull in. So for this, we're going to start with the hydrologic hazard, which we just set from, this is all going to get pulled from the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. So we're told to copy this range of cells from this worksheet in this spreadsheet and then paste it into cell C10. And we need to make sure that we pull the entire table when we do this. Let's try to go side by side. I want So what I'm going to pull from the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet is this entire portion of the table. I'm going from stage through the um, percentages over and get the probability distribution. I'm told to go from C8 down to H57, and that'll be the entire table. And you'll notice that we had data for one less row than what the table um, can fit. I still want the entire table, including those dashes, the unused row. So I will copy that. And then I'm going to paste as values here. So that pulls in my stage frequency curve. And you've got a plot where you can check to make sure that that all looks correct. And then from there, the other stuff that I need is going to come from the homework five file. So I can now close the stage frequency spreadsheet. Normally I would save it. I've got it saved somewhere else, so I'm, I'm not going to save this version. All right. So I've got my stage frequency relationship in. The next thing I need is going to be the peak stages to evaluate the system response for. 
So these are going to be the stages that I'm going to evaluate EFM2 for. So scrolling down, looks like the first two nodes are independent of stage. The third one, though, shows all the pools that were evaluated during the elicitation. These elevations are what's going to go into this column here. So I can either punch those in, or I think you can copy and paste special and transpose them. But as we punch them in, again, it needs to go from low to high. And when we put them in, we'll get the um, expected, it'll interpolate off our curves to show us our expected annual exceedance probability, just to get you an idea of what stages you're evaluating there, okay? So we have those five stages. So that's everything I need for this particular sheet. So then moving over, I've got spots to pull in my life loss and economic cost data, which is gonna come from the homework five sheet. So let's go there now. So we're told to use a beta PERT distribution for both breach and non-breach life loss and then to correlate breach and non-breach life loss. And the spreadsheet is already set up to correlate things. And I'll show you if you want to change that, how to do that. All right, so my first input is gonna be my exposure. I got 0.45 per day, 0.55 per night. And then my breach and non-breach um, distribution is going to be beta PERT. Click and hit execute, and it gets my spreadsheet all set up and ready to go for that distribution. So now I'm just inputting data. And for a PERT distribution, we need a min, a most likely, and a max. So we will punch those in and pull the stages. And again, always pasting as values. I've got my breach day life loss. Once that's in, the spreadsheet will calculate the mean for me. And then I need the breach life loss. And then we will do the same thing. I don't need a standard deviation. We'll do the same thing for the non-breach, which is in the tables just below. All right, so that should be, did I leave something out? No, we're good now. So that should be all the inputs for um, the life loss worksheet. Now I know some people had had trouble and were getting an error early on. And a lot of that was because when you first started putting your data in, you started punching into where you have the option to sample percentiles. And then when you change the distribution, it was still seeing that, you know, this table had been started to fill out, but wasn't completed. So that's why the spreadsheet was flagging an error. It, it would not affect your calculations in any way, because once you change the distribution, the spreadsheet isn't using it. Um, if I've got some time um, next month, I'll go back into the error checker to uh, make sure that error doesn't populate if the distribution's changed, but that caused an error for several people. So basically, when you start filling out a table, the spreadsheet kind of makes you fill out the entire table. All right, so that covers our life loss inputs, and then we need to go, we'll do the same thing for our economic cost, which also comes from our homework file. We'll pull our 
breach economic cost, and then our non-breach. We don't have to pull the whole table for this one. All right, so that's that. So this is the point where I would go ahead and save the file. Because like I said, the setup for failure modes one and three are gonna be very, very similar to what we're doing right here for PFM two. Uh, the one thing you will have to go back and change is these peak stages to evaluate different failure modes. We look at different stages depending on, you know, the location, what drives it, things like that. So, though, so uh, this column on the hydrologic hazard tab will be different for PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3, but all the other inputs on these three tabs down here are gonna be exactly the same. So I would save it, copy it, and then you'd have those, um, all those inputs already in for you when you get to the other failure mode. Right, so I've got inputs in for two thirds of the risk equation. I've got it in for the hazard and for the consequences. So next I need to start working on the system response. And again, the system response is gonna go through, let's see if I can make this a little easier to see. We're gonna go node by node for the system response. Um, these spreadsheets are set up to be used during an elicitation where, you know, the estimators are um, giving their evaluation of the particular node, and then the spreadsheet will give you some summary statistics. Um, as part of the elicitation process, if you need a second response, there's a spot for that to go in. But then in the end, the team discusses and comes to a consensus team estimate. And it's the consensus team estimate that gets carried forward into the actual calculations. So it's in this spot where we're going to pull um, the values that are given to us from the homework file, and we'll put them in here. Okay. So let's scroll down to PFM2. So this is a backwards erosion failure mode. The Let's see if I can do this a different way. All right, so we got a, a backward erosion piping failure mode. It is eight nodes, I believe. Yeah, and some of these are independent of stage, whereas others are dependent on stage. We have um, several failure nodes, all of which are getting a assigned a triangular distribution, and then we also have one intervention node. Reason it's important to call that out is by policy, we need to do the calculations both with and without intervention. So we need to tell the spreadsheet which one is intervention for it to know which one to pull out for the without intervention calcs. All right. So we got our first node here. Again, it's independent of pool, and we need to pick what stages we want to evaluate this node for. So if you remember on the hydro hydrologic hazard tab, we punched in some elevations. Those elevations will show up in a drop down here. At a minimum, we need to pick the lowest and the highest. And the spreadsheet will interpolate in between as necessary. Um, the other thing you can do is you can always just click peak stage and it will pull all of them in. That's an option. And then when something is, your probabilities are independent of stage, you would just set the same probability for each of them. Um, but to be consistent with the spreadsheet, let's just do it like, that. So I'm going to put the minimum stage in, the maximum stage in. Scroll down here. We are told that we are going to use a triangular distribution. So I'm going to go ahead and pick this. I talked about during the um, 
during office hours, the difference between these two. So stage dependent is going to allow you to input, it's going to set up a distribution for every stage. Each stage is going to have its own distribution. If you choose stage independent, it will only set a distribution for the first stage and then make um, set all the other stages equal to that one distribution. So if you've got something that is independent of stage, you can pick either one, but independent is going to run a lot faster because it's only pulling one distribution. So I'm going to choose that there, and then I need to execute the sheet, and then I'm set to copy and paste those, those values from the homework file in. So once I do that, I get a summary plot of the elicited probability versus stage. Always a good idea to look at that to make sure that how things increase with stage makes sense. Then you also have the ability to look at the PDF of your distribution to make sure that that makes sense. You can, they're all the same for these two, but you've got the drop down to cycle through the different stages. So that is how to set up node one. And we'll go through and we'll repeat the process for each node that we have data until we got that finished. So node two is also stage independent. So we'll get those. Triangular distribution. And I'll pull those values in. Node three, this one is going to be pool dependent. So I'm going to go ahead and click that peak stage so it populates all of them across. This time I'm going to choose triangular distribution stage dependent. Click execute. And then I'll pull the node three data in. And again, we've got different distributions. You can see how it changes based on stage. They all look a little different. All right. So then node four, just continue on. Node four is going to be um, stage dependent as well. And there's conditional formatting built into this as well to help you with errors. So I'll always paste these values. Node five is independent. that. All right. Node 6, I believe, is independent, but it's also deterministic. So I don't have a probability distribution there. So this node is a, a certainty to occur, at least in the team's judgment. So I can pick these two stages again. It's already set up for no distribution, so I don't have to hit execute. I can just punch those in. Now, node seven, what's special about this one is that node seven is gonna be um, an intervention node. This is the first one that wasn't a failure node. So we will need to change our node type at the top from failure to intervention. It is dependent on stage, so we'll go ahead and click uh, peak stage there. We're doing a triangular distribution, stage dependent. And that should be set to copy and paste. Yeah, it's that relationship. And then the last one will be the breach node, which is pool dependent. I 
and I'll pull the note eight values in. All right, so that should give me all the nodal data that I need to allow the spreadsheet to calculate the system response. Um, before moving on to the risk calculations tab, I'll tell you the reason that the spreadsheet is set up like this, where you have the choice of what stages to evaluate, is because sometimes when you get into a risk assessment and you're, you're in the elicitation and you know, you're through several nodes and then you realize maybe because of some analysis results or whatever, that there's a stage that you want to evaluate that you did not evaluate for the prior nodes. So what the spreadsheet's going to do is it's always going to look for, you're allowed to pick anything from this table, but only things from this table. So let's say I had wanted to add a stage in here at like 570. I would punch elevation 570 in and move these values down so that I keep everything going from low to high. But because of how it's set up now, I don't have to go back and add in 570 to any of these other nodes. In the past, you would have had to, and that becomes really annoying and cumbersome later. So if it didn't matter, the spreadsheet is going to interpolate and find that 570 value for you, but maybe you define it for a later node if you wanted to add it in. So that's why that's there. So if you ever get into a spot where you decide you want to add a node, you can do that. You just have to change it on this tab and this tab only, and then you can use it for all the uh, preceding nodes. Okay. All right, so we're ready to move on to the risk calculations tab. So when we get here, you'll see we've got a summary table that has pulled in all of our data. It'll show you, you know, what distribution you chose. And then we move down here to our system response. It'll pull in all of the nodal estimates and multiply them together to get your system response. And then after you run it, it'll give you the mean of that output here. You have the choice for your interpolation method. We'll stick with semi-log for PFM2. Um, C-variant might be marginally better. I don't know. I didn't check. Normally, we don't check, and we'll just roll through with um, semi-log for most internal erosion type failure modes. So we'll have, uh, without considering intervention, we'll have a table for considering intervention. And then scrolling down, I will have a table that pulls in all my stage frequency data. Um, you have the option to add or remove non-exceedance. In the vast majority of cases, you want that non-exceedance probability in your first bin, and that's the spreadsheet default, so we don't have to click anything, but you can remove it if you want, add it back later, whatever. Um, you'll notice that column L doesn't have, just has a bunch of dashes. Reason being, we are set up right now for a deterministic analysis. And I'll switch that in a minute. Um, and when I do, this will fill in. Uh, the spreadsheet also pulls in the consequence data, and you've got, I think we were told to correlate our breach and non-breach consequences. The correlation matrix shows up at the beneath these tables. You can click this plus sign to see it. Um, because we're correlating, they're all ones. If you had wanted them to be uncorrelated, then you would change everything um, except the ones on the, at the top. It would change all those things to zero. So these would all be zero, so on and so forth, all the way down, but you'd leave the top one as a, a one. Reason being, it has to be correlated with itself. So I'll hide that. So if you were doing this one deterministically, you would get uh, a mean probability of 9.66, 10 to the minus seven for without, 
3 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, for with intervention. And you can see the average annual life loss and the um, N bar. Um, this spreadsheet will also split the um, stage frequency when we start um, discretizing into partitions. It splits them into even intervals. So if for whatever reason you didn't want to use inter even intervals, maybe you've got a failure mode that was super sensitive around a specific elevation, you can override any of these values in these yellow cells and the spreadsheet will handle it. You just got to make sure that things are going from low to high. Okay. So um, since we do, we do have at risk and we want to run it probabilistically, we'll go ahead and go to the drop down and choose probabilistic and let it do its thing. So now I have, um, you'll notice I have a distribution now in column L. Now, one thing that it has been doing recently, you'll notice that I've got an error somewhere once I made that switch. And for whatever reason, this table isn't populating. Now, this is an at-risk Microsoft Excel issue, not a spreadsheet issue. It happens sometimes, but not all the time. If you go to at-risk, um, they, they'll pull up, yeah. What they call their knowledge base, they've got a lot of frequently asked questions. And what it's telling me is that I've got, sometimes it just doesn't, like Excel doesn't know to recognize the at-risk functions. Sometimes that's because you maybe have been in manual calculation mode. That's not it for us. Um, the two workarounds are um, you can do, um, you can run a simulation with one iteration, or you can uh, do a search and replace, search and find all equals and replace all equals with equals. So you're not really changing anything but it forces Excel to look through every sheet. Um, typically, I will do the one iteration deal. That tends to be pretty quick. So I'll change the number of iterations to one, run it, and then those oops, errors should go away. You'll notice it populated and my error went away. So it's Again, that's a, that's a quirk of um, at risk and Excel just not talking to each other very well. Otherwise, the spreadsheet's pretty big, so you could look for equal signs and find and replace them. But as you can imagine, there are a lot of equal signs in these worksheets, so it it can take more than a minute for that to run. All right, but once we're set up. I don't have any errors. Everything should be set and good to go. Um, there'll be a table for the risk output um, and then a spot where it's going to report the mean after I run it. That's the mean of my one simulation. Um, we are going to do, let's do 1,000 for the for this homework. So. For an individual failure mode, let's say you're in an elicitation and you've got everything filled out, we like to look at the results in re real time to make sure that they match our understanding, that you know everything makes sense. To get a decent mean, a thousand iterations is probably going to be enough. Now, when you get to um, pulling everything together for the final report and you want to get a full um, representation of your uncertainty, that's when you need to bump the number of iterations up to a thousand or more, or excuse me, 10,000 or more. Uh, so for the interest of time on this one, I'm just going to run um, a thousand iterations and we'll go from there. We'll check our settings again to make sure that multiple CPUs are disabled and that smart sensitivity is disabled, which both are. And then I'll click simulate and it should do its thing. Um, I'll get asked about the correlation matrix similar to what we saw on the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. Yes, we want to continue the simulation and then it should take a minute or two 
to chug through a thousand iterations. Um, one thing I will say about at risk is that uh, it will run every spreadsheet that you have open. Um, right now I've got two spreadsheets open. I've got this PFM risk spreadsheet and then I've got the homework file. Uh, the homework file doesn't have any at risk functions in it, so it really doesn't tank my runtime, but um, always be sure to, you know, it's best to have one, the one spreadsheet that you're running open and all the others closed so that it doesn't end up looking through a million of different cells that you're not trying to run. So while this simulation um, finishes up, does anybody have any questions on what I did to set up the PFM risk spreadsheet for PFM2? Hey, Damon, I guess I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Whoever's first. Well, I don't feel like I was first, but I think it's easy. On the node sheets, all the triangles were skewed right, I think. Okay. You said that's normal, right? We expect that? Um, you said all are skewed to the right. Oh, that one's that lined one, up pretty nice. That one's, that's going to just be a function of the elicitation and what your elicitors decide. I mean, there'll be plenty of times where, you know, the most likely value will be on the um, closer to the lower end of the range, and there'll be some times where it's closer to the higher end of the range. It just depends on their judgment. Okay, so it comes out of the spread from most likely to lesser and more likely, not from previous calculations being done on a log scale. Correct. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so reason we do it this way, I, I find it easier when you're trying to um, assign a probability to something that's, un that's uncertain. I think it's easier to think about what the range could be. And we'll set that as the low and the high. And then, okay, I've got my range. Where within that range do I expect it to be? Do I think it's closer to one side or the other? Do I think it's in the middle? And then we'll use those three point estimates uh, for the node forward. Um, I think you mentioned log scale. You have the option to transform those probabilities um, and do like a, a log distribution if you want. Um, so what that would do is that'll switch this scale and put it on a log scale and you know the plot will look different. I don't want to change it because I just ran it, but um, the times you might want to consider that is when you have a very wide range of uncertainty. A lot of times when we're estimating these things, we think in terms of order of magnitude. And basically, if, if you do a log transformation on your distribution, you're running the distribution on the orders of magnitude. So think back to, yeah. I guess it would have been m module four where we have that um, verbal probability mapping scheme, where I think um, unlikely was 0.1, very unlikely was 0.01, virtually impossible was 0.001. Let's say those had been the, the three inputs, you know, low, best, and high. Probably thinking about things in terms of order of magnitude, so log would probably be the best choice there. And again, that's something that's decided by the elicitation team. Okay. And then the related question is, if you decide on a triangle, why would you decide that rather than a beta perch? Like a triangle um, gives you a wider spread? Yeah, sim simplicity. I mean, there, uh, you can use either. So the... Um, the, the PERT distribution is going to give more weight to um, the most likely value, and it's going to give less weight to the tails, whereas the triangular distribution is going to give more to the tails. Um, I would say neither is right or wrong. It's kind of up to um, the uh, elicitors. 
Um, this spreadsheet in particular only allows you to do triangular or uniform. That's generally how, I guess, the, the Bureau used to do things too. They're simple, they're easy to understand. Um, but if you start to learn and understand how these, I guess, spreadsheets work and where the distributions go or put, you can always override it, customize it, and use a PERT if you want to. Okay, thank you. Yep, I think there was another question out there. Yes, uh, I just, I want, maybe this is just because I'm a, I'm a bit basic, but, and I'm external to the core, but um, it took me a minute to wrap my head around, around how, um, you know, the PFM risk spreadsheet feeds into the project risk spreadsheet. And I guess I was wondering, like, do you typically, when you're running these for multiple failure modes, do you save a copy of the actual spreadsheet for each failure mode, or do you just use the same spreadsheet and save the results in an external file? Um, I was curious how you do that in practice, and I think, you know, it might be helpful to kind of, you know, you in the presentation video, you mentioned how they all feed into one another, but it might be worth, at least in my mind, maybe just having another anecdote on, you know, how you go about doing that and, and making sure that, okay, when you're running this spreadsheet, you know, close all the others because it can, I, I heard that in the office hours and I kind of did, but I had some issues running them, you know, running at risk, uh, you know, <laughs> because of that. So I was just, yeah, just something to, it's just a food for thought, I guess. Right on. So, so what I will typically do is I will save a, I will save the Sage, distri Sage Frequency Distribution Spreadsheet, so I have that copy, and then I will have the individual, I will have a PFM risk spreadsheet for each failure mode that I evaluate, and I will save those. Um, whether you save the simulation for the individual failure modes or not, that's up to you. I typically don't because the the real simulation, the real results that we're using in the report are gonna come from the project risk spreadsheet. But reason I save those individually is because those will also have the elicitation results in here. These tables would get filled out during an elicitation and I would want to know what those are and have those for later um, if questions come up. So. Again, I would have individual files for each failure mode. And then from each failure mode that gets pulled into the project risk, but everything that gets reported in the report, you know, for a risk assessment comes from the project risk spreadsheet. That's where the final calcs are happening. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I guess, I think, you know, I, I have sort of stumbled on, uh, <laughs> The fact that I think when you're, if you're saving to a OneDrive location, um, you can have, there can be some issues with running at risk in Excel. I, I think some of them have been addressed. Some of them have been addressed according to their website, but they're still, um, you know, you can't undo things and things like that. And so I had it crash and then I have like different versions come up. It was a little weird. So I don't know exactly why it did that, but uh, it, it made, it, it kind of got to the point where, okay, you should really save it for each failure mode, um, just for at least for homework purposes, you have the results. So, um, but yeah, that makes right sense. That, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. I'd also add that I think it's good to put all the files in the same folder, especially when you start trying to go from the project risk spreadsheet to seeing your results and the risk plots in summary tends to, everything tends to work better when they're all in the same spot. All right, so any other questions? I get the simulation results for this one pulled up. All right, so there's a, a worksheet in here called simulation results. Um, right now they're clear, but to pull everything in, I'm gonna click the button that says plot simulation results. And it's gonna go through and pull all that data in for me so I can plot it all. And then you'll notice that the 
pretty much all of column A turns red and it stays red for every sheet to tell you, hey, look, you got your simulation data in there. Don't run a new simulation without clearing it first, which I still forget to do. And then it takes a long time, but, um, but scrolling through, this will give you, you can get your mean system response curves. You can see your uh, FN scatter plot, get some percentages, how the points plot relative to court guidelines. Um, and then you've got the CDFs for the annual probability of failure. You can see how it changes versus your APF changes versus peak stage, average annual life loss, so on and so forth. Okay. And then all the data that it's pulling in, all the iteration results are down here, as is, you know, I've got a bunch of NAs because it's set up for 10,000 and we ran 1,000, so those don't populate. And you have the percentile data, stuff like that. All right. So once we have done all of that for each of our potential failure modes, we're then going to copy and paste from the PFM risk spreadsheet into the project risk spreadsheet. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm not going to save it because I've got it elsewhere. So that's what I'm showing. That's what I got going on over here. I've got sort. So I created spreadsheets for each failure mode, PFM 1, 2, and 3. And then I'm going to pull into the project risk spreadsheet. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start by opening a fresh copy of the project risk spreadsheet. All right, so on the cover sheet of this one, we need to, I mean, you can type in your project name, risk purpose, blah, blah, blah. Um, we need to add um, our list of failure modes and a short description, and we have to type these in. So when we type one of these in, say PFM1, a worksheet will appear for us to start adding data into. So we've got three of them, so we will punch those all in. I think the first one was overtopping. Second one was backward erosion piping. And then the third one was concentrated leak erosion. Okay. So all of these worksheets are going to basically be set up the same, and they're set up to mimic the risk calculation sheet that we just saw in uh, the PFM risk spreadsheet. The reason they're set up that way is it should make things easier to know where to copy and paste from because everything looks exactly the same. Um, there are uh, instructions for what to copy. My guess is most people don't read them. They just kind of look at one spreadsheet and look at the other and figure, oh, this goes here. And that should work. Just make sure that when we copy the table, we copy the entire table. It needs all of it. Okay. So I'm going to pull up the um, sheet that already has set up for PFM1, we'll, we'll walk through pulling all three of these in and go from there. Um, no, and no. All right. So it'd be a lot easier. It's a lot easier when you got multiple monitors, so bear with me here. All right. So. I need to start pulling from the PFM worksheet into the project risk worksheet so I can do all the calcs together. So I will, first step is to copy this entire table and you go over and grab all the way to the last stage and then all the way down to the very, very bottom of the table. And then I will paste that as values into cell C6. So that should pull that in, and then um, that starts to pull 
I have to pull the formulas from the PFM sheet to know what distributions are being used and things like that. And it'll reference the table above. So the next step is to go find these guys here. So again, for node one all the way through node 10, even for the ones that we're not using. I'll copy from the PFM one sheet. And then I'm going to paste this formulas which is the one that has the FX right here, there. Give it a second to calculate. There we go. So having done that, it's still struggling. There we go. All right. It is referencing this table, and it is referencing these um, names or distribution names, and it is pulling in the appropriate distribution that we assigned in the PFM REST spreadsheet. So that's why we need to paste this formulas there. So I should have something for both with and without intervention. So the next thing I need to do is I need to pull in the data for um, the stage frequency relationship. Again, everything is formatted essentially the same. So I just need to grab stage through uh, the probability distribution column. I got to get the whole thing here copy and then paste his values here. Now, for the spreadsheet to pull in the distribution, because there's a lot of distributions being run here, there's a macro that will look at what's in column H and then pull or then input the proper distribution um, in column L. So I will, I have my data in, and again, I did the entire table, including the dashes, and then I will click execute, and it'll pull in the distribution that I have defined, which in this case is beta pert. It goes through one by one, it's a little slow, but not horrible. All right, so that's set up. So now I need to pull in my consequence data so I can copy and paste the exposure data. And then I need to pull in the um, consequence data for breach and non-breach. So I'm using a beta PERT distribution so I need to select beta pert from the drop down and click execute. That'll pull in the, the proper distribution. And then from there, I'll be set to copy and paste the input data to those distributions from the PFM risk spreadsheet. So I need my day breach life loss to start with. Again, I want the entire, basically every row of this table. I cannot leave any of them blank. And I want the night. Go over here. And we'll do the same thing for day and night for the non-breach. And it looks like I forgot to pull the economic cost for breach. I'll go back and get that in a second. Like I said, way easier when you have multiple screens and you can really see side by side what's going on. All right, so now I need the economic cost. First for the breach. Now for the non-breach. Okay. And that is 
most everything I need. We'll switch this over to probabilistic. And again, I'm having the same issue that I had with the PFM risk where it's not recognizing the distribution when it's in there. It'll, it'll fix that when I actually run a simulation. Um, the last input I need is going to be the stage partitions that I set for the failure mode. Now, one thing to remember is these stage partitions, they need to be the same for every failure mode that you're analyzing. If you don't, it'll mess up the um, big FN plot when we make it, so they have to be the same. So if you override the defaults for one, you have to override the defaults for the other. They have to be the same from one failure mode to the next. So I will go ahead and copy and copy those out of the PFM sheet and then paste here for the other one. So that should be everything that I need for um, PFM 1 it is. So just for example, if I come up here and click, I get a number. So it's one of those things, again, at risk and Excel are not quite talking to each other very well. That's what that error is. So I can go ahead, that's everything I need for PFM1. So I can go ahead and close that. And then I'm gonna start pulling in stuff for PFM2, so on and so forth. But just to show you one of the ways to fix this, again, we talked about how if there's that problem where, you know, Excel isn't recognizing the formulas that are in there, we talked about doing a one iteration simulation. You can also do a hit control S and do a find and replace. And then when you replace it, wait a second, you should get some numbers over, at least in these parts. Um, why am I not getting anything here? Something's up. Did I mess something up? making sure that everything is in. Yeah, so the other reason there's an error is because it's, it's, again, it's looking for these, this set of um, at-risk data. So if I were to search and replace and find those equal signs, and then you can see how cumbersome and annoying that can be sometimes. But now I should have some data, some results down at the bottom now. And this table starts to fill those things out. So I'm not going to go through and hunt and peck for all those um, those errors because once I run the simulation, those will resolve on their own. I'm going to move on and start inputting the data for PFM2 and for PFM3, which we'll do the exact same way as we just did. So let's find the sheet for PFM2 that pulled up. All right, so PFM2 spreadsheet is on the left, and the project risk is on the right. And again, everything we're gonna pull from comes from the risk calculations tab. So one thing that's different about, um, I guess, successive failure modes is that we have to click this button in the top left corner to set up the spreadsheet. Reason that button is there is there was it's, it's for runtime again. We don't want a bunch of empty sheets that we're not using to have a bunch of at-risk distributions and functions for it to look through. So they're cleared to start with until you need to use the spreadsheet and then you'll press the button. And if for whatever reason, maybe you, were, you had a failure mode and you want to remove it, you'll click the X and it'll delete all of the um, functions. All right. So I'm set to start pulling in the data for PFM2, just like I did for PFM1. So I'll copy the table, and paste here, and paste the values for this one. Um, one thing I forgot to do, PFM1 is 
linear, whereas the other ones were semi logs. Let's go ahead and get that changed. All right. So back to TFM2. I need to pull the nodal distribution formulas in. So that'll be these right here. Again, they, when in doubt, the instructions will tell you exactly what cells to pull from what worksheet and then where to paste them. All right, so that populated. I don't have to pull stage frequency data in for PFM2 because I already did it for PFM1 and it's going to be the same across all failure modes. So. It's just going to reference what we had for the prior failure mode. So nothing there. Um, exposure is the same way, um, as is the non-breach consequences. So I just need to pull in the um, the breach day and night consequences. So we selected our distribution there. We clicked execute, let that run. And now we can copy and paste from the PFM2 sheet. So we have my breach consequences. And then the night here. And that should finish out this table, which it does. I still got the errors because of that link, but I promise those will go away when I run an iteration. All right, so that's PFM2, and then we will repeat for PFM3. So go ahead and close PFM2 and open PFM3. So like I said, it's basically a big copy and paste exercise, just making sure that we're pulling the data from the spreadsheets we've already created and putting them in the correct spot. I would say the, the most common error is that, um, let's go ahead and populate the spreadsheet. Most common error is when people copy and paste, they're copying and pasting from the right place, but they don't grab the entire table. We need the whole table in every instance. Even when we're not using nodes or rows or whatever. This is in fact PFM3. All right, so we got the system response stuff in now. Stage frequency gets carried over from our first PFM, and then we need to set up our life loss. So I need a PERT. Then we'll pull our day breach consequences and our night breach consequences. I think in my haste for PFM2, now that I'm thinking about it, I did not pull over the, um, I didn't scroll far enough to pull the economic cost. I'm going to pull that from this spreadsheet here because they're the same, but again, you want to make sure you get everything pulled in. Let's double check and see if I'm remembering right or not. I done it for did I do it for PFM one? I don't remember. Let's find out. 
All right, let's two. Didn't scroll far enough over that first. Go ahead. So when you're copying and pasting values, it doesn't matter where you're copying from in any instance. You can copy from the same spreadsheet if it's the same for breach consequences, et cetera. Right. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter where they come from. These are all inputs. So, I mean, you could type them in, you could copy from here. If you know that numbers are the same from one, two, or three, you can copy from what you already had in for one, two, or three. Yeah. Just in this instance, the consequences were the same across the board for all failure modes. That's that's the reason I can pull from PFM3 and punch it in for PFM2. I would not have been able to do that for system response because they're different. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, I just was confirming that that, that, that was the case. Yes. And that you're not you're not going to cause yourself any errors running running the spreadsheets, the simulation spreadsheets depending on where you copy and paste from because of conditional formatting or something like that, so. That's correct. All right, let's double check, make sure, since I've been working on one screen, let's make it big and make sure that we've got all our inputs in. So I've got the system response table for PFM1, with the proper interpolation method. This one's overtopping, and we'll typically do linear for overtopping. I got my formulas there for the rest and then say frequency, that error will go away when we run the simulation. And then I've got my day and night exposure, life loss, economic cost, both breach and non-breach. Looks like that one's set. Let's double check PFM2. Looks like we got everything. All right, and then PFM3. Same deal, I got my system response. Economic costs, yeah, looks like everything's good. So the final thing that we need to do before running this is we need to come over here on the SRP adjustment tab. We need to tell the spreadsheet how to handle overlap what risk model we want to use, you know, do we have a, uh, a dominant failure mode with how the event tree is set up or not. Um, we were told to do competing risk, so we will choose competing risk and then click execute and it'll set the sheet up to do that. So on this worksheet, it'll start with the unadjusted system response probabilities for uh, the midpoint peak stage at each partition. You'll see the, all those there. Now, if you remember, if we've got failure modes of a similar mechanism or the same mechanism, like, like we saw in module two, uh, let's say we had had two backward erosion typing failure modes. We would want to combine them into one estimate provided they have the same consequences um, or yeah, same consequences and things like that. Um, this would be the opportunity to combine those. And to do that, you would need to write an if statement to look up from the unadjusted probabilities to see which one is greater than the other. So the one that is greater would get a one in these cells. The one that um, is, the lower of the two would get a zero. So basically what we're saying is we're, we're taking 100% of the highest one and 0% of the lowest one when we calculate our total. The spreadsheet will still calculate the marginal of both, but it's just telling, telling you which one to include for the total. Now, in the case of homework five, all three of these are different mechanisms. So we don't need to we're not combining with anything, so we're just going to assign a one for each of these, which means we want to consider all of, all three of them 100%. So grab that, and we need to do that 
for, there's two tables. There's one for without intervention and then one for with. Um, because those if statements can be different, that's why we need two tables. So we'll pull those in. And then from there, the spreadsheet will do all the um, nasty, gnarly competing risk calculations for you. It's all set up. So that should be everything I need to then run the simulation. I had inputted things for PFMs 1, 2, and 3. I've got the adjustment tab set. Now I should be good to go. So let's go ahead and run a I'm going to run a one iteration simulation to make sure that none of those errors that were popping up were from something else. So this should go pretty quick. Ask me this twice. Click yes both times. You can see we've got almost 3,000 um, cells that have you know, distributions and stuff in them that it, that it looks through, maybe even more than that. All right. So if everything worked, all those errors should have gone away, which looks like it did for PFM1, looks like it did for PFM2, and for PFM3. Again, I know it's stupid, but I don't know a way to force Excel to always find those at-risk um, functions. Probably best that you know. Maybe one thing I could do is switch the um, the default to be a probabilistic analysis and make sure that it's referencing a net. Maybe that would work better. I don't know. I'll toy around with it, but just be aware of that issue that comes up frequently. All right, so everything's set. We said to do a thousand iterations, so I'll set it at a thousand. Click simulate, and it should take a few minutes to chug through. We'll see how long it takes. So while at risk is doing its thing, any questions on how to move from the PFM risk spreadsheet into the project risk spreadsheet? Damon. Surely it's not going to take 20 to run through. Yeah, go ahead. Can you re explain? Yeah where the uh, correlations show up in the prod, like in this spreadsheet. I thought the correlations were, were getting the outputs. Oh. So you remember Plus how- for the hydrologic ties to make the lines continuous. Yeah, so you remember how you go through and you set your distributions and then when you want to correlate them together, um, you would highlight them and you'd add the correlation matrix, right? Those are already added in to the spreadsheet. And when this is done running, uh, hold on, let me check to see if I saved one so we don't have to watch this thing run. Yeah, I already saved the results for one. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this so we don't have to watch it chug. So Adam, to answer, no, I did have one other spreadsheet open, but it doesn't have any at-risk things. Think of the time remaining as like one of those Windows progress bars that are never correct. You know, they'll tell you it's like eight hours and then it'll drop down to two minutes and then it'll come back to 15 minutes and just keeps bouncing around. The time that it gives you for a simulation will sometimes do that. It said 20 minutes, but was 10% in it was probably going to take four or five minutes to complete. All right, so uh, you were asking about the correlation matrices. So if you look in these distributions, you'll see that it has the risk core mat, and then it references the one for loading here, and then it has a cell for the 
first one. Those matrices are already input, and they're under. You'll find them under the table. So if you click plus, you'll see that they're all being all those you can um, search and find and um, see what what's being correlated with what. But those are all that's L209 through L258. That's all these distributions right here that are being correlated together. So you'll find one of these matrices for stage frequency. You'll find it for all our stage dependent nodes. You'll find them for uh, the consequences as well. So the only one that you would ever consider changing would be your life loss correlation matrix. Because right now, the spreadsheet defaults to correlating the breach and non-breached life loss together. If, um, um, if, you're, um, if it's a function of warning issuance or something like that, as opposed to, you know, percent mobilization, then maybe you would want to change those ones to zeros, but you have that option to customize as needed for your risk assessment. Did that, did that answer your question or was there anything more specific that you wanted to ask? It, it does. The matrix is used almost everywhere where we're correlating across a graph. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. So instead of watching this run, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out and pull one that I had already prepared prior to save some time. And this might be a way to show you, this be a good example to show you how um, this asks, again, does the simulation settings stored in it, do you want to change to match that of the workbook? Sure. And then because I have the, I'd already saved the simulation file within the same folder, it asked me, it knows that there was um, simulation results and asked me if I want to open them. Uh, I will click yes. So that should pull everything in now. Um, if it doesn't ask that, you can go over to utilities and then click open simulation file, find the file that goes with it and open it and it should populate within your spreadsheet. All right, so we've got um, a series of these uh, black tabs here that will show us some of the results. We've got our risk summary that will show us our uh, mean calculations that go into the residual risk, incremental, non-breach, and then the sum of which is the residual. You have your marginal um, risk for the individual failure modes, and then you'll have the total down at the bottom. And then there's also worksheets for the incremental risk. You can see how all that was computed and pulled together. Same with non-breach and residual. So once I have these run, I need to plot everything. And that's where the next spreadsheet comes into play, which is going to be our risk summary and plot spreadsheet. So we'll open that up. Main reason we separate the plot from the spreadsheet where we're actually doing the calculation is with every iteration at risk or Excel will refresh the plot. So again, it's a, it's a runtime thing and this makes it a, a lot faster. All right, so I've got the risk plots and summary sheet. Let me go ahead and delete that out because I had that saved in. So when I first get here, I go over to the cover sheet and you'll see a bunch of errors throughout all of the tabs. I need to tell the spreadsheet what file to link to. So I need to type in the spreadsheet name and the extension and they need to be in the same folder to work. So I will find that. I usually just copy and paste it because it's, oops. I usually go to rename and then I'll copy it 
just to make sure that I'm punching it in correctly. And then all of these are, the extension is XLSB. And when I type enter, it'll take a minute, but it should pull in and link to that spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet needs to be open for it to find it. So you'll see it pulled in pull PFMs one through three. And then I've got all my hazard data that it pulled in. Got a, a plot of that data. Got my non-breach tables. Uh, I have a worksheet for um, each PFM. So you can choose via dropdown which one that you want to, to view, and then it'll show you the results. You got your table, you got your mean system response, you've got your um, percentiles on your system response, both with and without intervention, your life loss tables and plots, and then eventually you got your FN scatter for the failure mode, and then some CDS and um, risk profile plots. So then if we go over here to the total risk summary, this pulls in all the total risk calculations. So we've got the calculation for the residual risk. You've got your summary, your marginals, and your total both with and without intervention. You see how those uh, means for each failure mode in the total plot out. And then we see the scatter plot for um, the project. Um, the loan input um, in this spreadsheet that has anything to do with the calculations is going to be for your individual most at risk. And we need that fatality rate from LifeSim, which from the homework five file looks like it's 0.65. So we'll punch that in. Give it a second. And then it'll pull in. Um, the limits there. So really all that's doing is it's taking the APF and it's multiplying it by that fatality rate. And then scrolling down, you've got your, your big FN plots for non-breach, incremental, and residual. And then they've got, well, it's disappearing on me. You've got the um, percentiles for each of those is plotted as well. So a lot of data, some of which goes into um, the main body of our risk assessment reports, some of which um, we just put in the appendix. I um, don't know why every time I zoom in it disappears, but they're there somewhere. There they are. So you have all that data. So this, this is all formatted in a way so that if we were to print to a PDF, we can create a complete folio that has all the inputs and the outputs from our calculations. So that gets really helpful for reviewers and then for, you know, somebody picking up the report down the road to know what you did and how you did the calculations and where how you got to where you got to. So what I have found is you know, the best way to, let me give it a second. I find it best when you go to print to not use like a, the Adobe PDF maker. I think that Microsoft print to PDF does a better job, particularly on the big or on the FN scatter plot. So what I will typically do is I will um, highlight the cover sheet hydrologic hazard, non-breach. I'll hold control and highlight all of those and then come over here to print. And again, I will print as a, um, use Microsoft print to PDF to do it. Uh, let's call it version five. And it'll go through and print each page. Okay, okay, okay. Might take a minute. Okay. 
And then I should have a nice folio, of, again, all the inputs and outputs that I can just stick in the appendix. Um, the one catch, though, is that it will only pull the data for one failure mode at a time. So whatever you have up first under the um, PFM risk summary tab, that's what's going to print. So print it all and then individually print what other failure modes you have and then you can um, combine those PDFs together. Um, when you switch the failure modes to update the header that shows up, you'll just click that update header button and then it'll pull whatever name you've got in right there. It'll, it'll put that as the header for those particular pages of the um, folio. But again, when you get to the total project risk, you can see how clean those print and plot. When you do it with um, Adobe, it just it doesn't look quite as nice. Any questions on how we link those spreadsheets together? Of course, I have another question, Damon. Go for it. So I had to do a lot of copy and paste, uh, and the spreadsheets are intentionally isolated from each other so that you can close the unnecessary ones for just good practice without risk. At least I think that's why. But it means we're yeah. copying and pasting, and the spreadsheets don't actually link together a whole bunch. Yep. And, and yet there are certainly links. And while it was probably unwise, I broke links uh, when I was working with these files just to get rid of them because I know you can't troubleshoot the damn things. What The spreadsheets are not chained with references and yet there are links that make references. What, what do the links actually do in these spreadsheets? I don't think there are any. My guess is when you were copying and pasting and moving through, it was linking to plots and it was looking for plot references. More often than not, that's what's going on. Okay. So th there shouldn't be any references from one spreadsheet to the next that are built in. Okay, thank you. I like the okay, spreadsheets me, better me, now. <laughs> let me pull one up to, to double check and prove that. Let's go ahead and close this out. Was there one in particular PFM or project risk that you wanted to look at? I got project risk open, let's look at yeah, that. Just the PFM one on 2A, I know it happened. And it, basically everything happened twice because I had to shut down and start back up again. I gotcha. Um, should be in data, isn't it? Yeah, I don't have any links. I will say that when I was building these, man, <laughs> and sometimes it was like conditional formatting is another thing that can copy and paste over sometimes if you're not if, you, if you're not pasting values. So you know, when I was putting these together, you open the sheet and tell you that it couldn't link to something else and you're trying to find it and man hunting for them was was a pain best way to find them is to period you know um methodically delete one worksheet at a time to hone in on it what worksheet it is and then oftentimes it was either a plot conditional formatting or data validation with one of your drop downs those are usually the biggest offenders Okay, thank you. Any other? Yeah, you bet. Any other questions? Should our simulation results look almost exactly like yours, or if there's should there will there be slight discrepancies? It'll it can look slightly different. I would say that your your mean point should be in essentially the same place if you did a thousand iterations. Um, your summary tables will be a little different. If we had all ran 10,000 iterations in a simulation, those numbers would be a lot closer to each other. Um, 
but certainly within the same order of magnitude. And my guess is it would just be, you know, if you're comparing um, like these tables here, only thing might change would be the trailing decimals, but only by a small amount. Makes sense. Yes, thank you. So any more in the core, like I said, for the last decade or so, this is these have been the spreadsheets that we've been using to do our risk calculations. Um, we're transitioning and moving towards uh, using RMC total risk, which is a uh, standalone software that the core has developed. Uh, we'll go over that in the next module. I think you'll appreciate that everything stays within one file, which is nice. Um, you'll certainly appreciate the speed at which it runs a simulation it is lightning fast. So instead of taking, you know, an hour or two to run a full project risk file, we're talking seconds, which is really, really nice. Um, I still continue, and I'm, as we go, you know, future versions of this course, I'm still going to include a module for QRA calcs because there's some limitations in total risk, at least in this current version, that it can't do. And having the flexibility to uh, customize a spreadsheet and do those things is still valuable. So those spreadsheets will stay out there. Um, also, I find it helpful during an elicitation you know, to use that PFM risk spreadsheet because, you know, it, it's set up to follow the core solicitation procedure. It puts it all in one spot and then you can um, see the results quickly in real time. And then you have everything in one spot that you can then pull from and copy and paste into total risk when you get there. So we'll cover that in the Next module, um, the um, course work, workbook says we'll have that posted Tuesday. So um, don't think about DLS 105 over the weekend. We'll, we'll hit it and get our last two modules knocked out uh, starting on Tuesday. Uh, in the meantime, let's get the SOCA stuff pulled up. So we'll get to the quiz the exact same way. Um, it's DLS 105 R5 to get to this quiz. And forgive me, I need to look up what the buzzword is. I think it's uncertainty, but I should probably look that up. Or I tell everybody wrong. Well. Give me one second. Okay, maybe two seconds. Where to put it? All right, I found it, sorry, sorry for that delay. It is uncertainty, yeah. So the, the buzzword for the module five quiz is uncertainty and you'll have a handful of questions. I think there's four related to using um, RMC QA calcs and we'll go from there, okay? Last call for any questions? 
Sure, of course I have one more. <laughs> uh, I was curious if the core has somewhere and understanding that you can sort of each risk analysis will have its own you know uniqueness to it, but uh, it seems like you typically use different interpolation methods for different um, things like stage frequencies typically linear. It seems like internal erosion is typically semi logarithmic. You know, for those of us who are just learning this, uh, is there like a handy reference sheet or, you know, what you typically would use understanding that could vary from each one? Each yeah, risk the, the be right, the, the best reference I have um, is what I put together in module two when we go over interpolation. So there's a, a slide in there. I think I've shared it at least once or twice. Um, that'll walk you through what we typically do. Rule of thumb is look at how things are plotted. You know, generally, you know, stage frequency is going to be on the probability scale, so we'll use z variate. Um, we typically plot most system response probabilities on a log scale, so we'll use semi-log. The, um, I guess, the lone failure mode that we typically always do linear is going to be overtopping. And that's because you're only going over a few um, set of a few stages. You always have that zero point in there. Those probabilities are generally the same order of magnitude and go from there. So if you want, I can pull that um, slide out and send it to you. That, that's the best one that I know of. No, that's fine. I can go find it, but thanks for pointing me there. Yeah, you bet. Looks like Jerry chatted and said it's uh, slide six in module two. Well, cool. If nobody's got anything else, um, I think this is going to be this one was probably going to be the longest QA of the. Uh, of the course, so I'm glad we got through that. Um, but yeah, we'll go. Um, I didn't look at the schedule before this call to catch you whenever the next uh, office hours is and start chugging through module six, which will be posted uh, on Tuesday. So thanks everybody for your time and we'll we'll see you next time.